What's up everyone, it's Kadi with Money Vesting. Welcome on board for this Market Open live stream. We are ready to go. Jackson Hole Economic Symposium is today and Jerome Powell is gonna be giving his speech at 10 a.m. Eastern, so in about an hour, we've got plenty of time to prep and of course, take a look at the pre-market as well. Hope you all are doing great. Uh, if you guys can see me and hear me, just give me a thumbs up. We should be all set and all ready to go. Just wanna make sure the audio and the video is working well. So just give me a thumbs up here in the live chat. Uh, QQQ is pretty much flat, only down four basis points. We did get some numbers uh, from the personal income and outlays uh, and the PCE numbers as well, which I'll go over. And of course, we also got uh, the retail inventories, wholesale inventories. They were both higher on a month over month basis, but just by slightly here. Um, so SPY is pretty much flat again in anticipation of what that uh, Jerome Powell <clears throat> what Jerome Powell is gonna be talking about. And of course the Dow Jones uh, right now also just flat here, only up 11 basis points right now. So going over to some of the updates and some pre-market news here. So UK energy bills to rise by 80% in October as regulators announce hike. Uh, so Britain's energy regulator announced Friday will raise its main cap on consumer energy bills to an average of 3,549 pounds or almost $4,200 from about 1,971 pounds same time last year. So pretty much more than almost almost doubling here, going up over 80 to 90% here uh, on a year-over-year -year basis. That is really, really dramatic increase. We've already talked about the inflation crisis over in the UK and of course how the Bank of England also foresees inflation to top as much as 13.3% in October. And they're also expecting a recession to begin in Q4 of this year and lasting five quarters all the way through 2023. So uh, this is obviously not great news for the UK, but this is something that they are dealing with at the moment. And here comes Powell. The whole week was building up to this point. Uh, Fed Chair Jerome Powell is slated to speak at 10 a.m. Eastern uh, from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and the entire investing world will be listening and investors are keen to hear how hawkish he will sound when discussing the Fed's next moves in its fight against rampant inflation. And the central bank's main policy setting committee is expected to raise rates by another three quarters of a percentage point, in other words, 75 basis points, in September next month, but markets are looking for clarity about what Powell and crew will do beyond that. Um, so that is obviously going to be very, very important. So the build up to Jackson Hole puts the Fed Chair Powell in a tough spot. Uh, number one, everyone in the Fed, whether they are hawks or doves, has said fighting inflation is their top priority, even if there is a recession. So that's something that we have also discussed on the channel where they've mentioned that they will not hesitate, they will not, uh, you know, flounder on their goal to bring inflation back down. In other words, restore price stability. That's their main goal. That's their main objective. And the fact that all the Fed members are, for the most part, speaking in sync and that Powell represents the views of the rate setting FOMC indicate that is exactly what he will say. It is also widely expected he will again push back on the idea of a Fed pivot and note that the Fed will keep raising rates until it feels inflation is under control. So, um, of course, you know, I, I don't think they like the idea of a Fed pivot. I think that's something the market likes to at least anticipate from a Federal Reserve standpoint, because in the past we have seen a quote unquote Fed put. We have seen some expectations the Fed might pivot, but, um, you know, he might push back on that idea as well. And the market has already internalized this hawkish sentiment. Expectations for the Fed funds rate are now higher than they were just a few months ago. We'll talk about that in just a minute. So here are something really interesting things, right? What could make stocks drop dramatically versus what could make stocks go up on this Powell's speech? It really is a question of how hawkish or dovish he's going to be in his tone, in his words, in everything that he discusses, right? So if he sounded far more hawkish than the market expected, anything that would push expectations for a terminal Fed funds rate past what is currently expected, let's say if he said we would support a 100 basis point hike in September, or if he said that we are going to bring inflation down and we don't care if in the process of doing that, we have the greatest recession since the 1930s, that obviously is gonna stoke a lot of fear in the markets and could potentially result in a big sell-off. And what markets, uh, what would make the stocks go up on Powell's speech is the exact opposite if he hinted that Fed sensitivity to inducing a severe downturn or hinted that the Fed might end its rate hike program, in other words, a Fed pivot, or hinted that the Fed has already made substantial progress towards its goals of reducing inflation and that we can expect a smaller rate hike in the future, that might that might obviously um, you know open doors for the bulls to kind of take some long trades and push higher as well. 
Uh, unfortunately, the market on Thursday seemed to want to front run this expectation. The S&P was up 20 points in the last 40 minutes. We did see a pretty strong rally in the S&P 500. I mean, you know, right now already we're starting to see a little bit of a move to the upside. QQQs are up 23 basis points right now. We've got SPY up over 19. And yesterday, S&P was up over 1.4%. And of course, the NASDAQ up 1.77 and the Dow rallying over 1%. Yesterday, and even more unfortunately, even prior to Thursday, the market already has a bit of a relief rally. Not only are prices up, but valuations are substantially higher uh, than they were two months ago. We also talked about the valuations currently for the S&P 500 now trading at 18 times forward earnings once again, uh, which are up substantially from 16 times forward earnings back in June. So if you come over to our S&P 500 um, valuation spreadsheet, trying to get a good understanding on where we are. Uh, we're almost at 18 times earnings based on 2022 numbers. Uh, and then on a forward basis, you know, $240, we're a little bit over 17 times earnings. Um, and then uh, based on 2023, we're trading at 16.5, but that is also based on uh, these estimates for the earnings per share, right? That's gonna be 230, 240, and $250 in earnings per share for 2022 forward and 2023 respectively. Uh, so again, we have pushed up quite a bit. Uh, just a few few months ago, we were obviously trading, you know, in the 38 to $3,600 range. Uh, and that was obviously much lower valuation, somewhere between 15 and 16 times earnings. And uh, of course, we have pushed up quite a bit from those levels. Uh, bottom line is it's reasonable to assume the Fed officials are not delighted with the recent market rallies. So Powell will want to dampen the dovish expectations, but he can't dampen them too much. Uh, he's playing a very long game, uh, one that once the game starts rolling, makes it harder to change the rules uh, midstream. So again, that's going to be very, very important. And Warren's Jeremy Siegel says the Fed needs to hike rates only by another 100 basis points. Um, and this right here is going to be the actual Fed Funds Futures CME watch tool. And right now, as it stands, you'll notice that the 75 basis point hike expectations have moved up over the last um, few months here. So let me just see if I can... Uh, make that bigger. So right here, there we go. So this right here is the dark blue bar you see is for where we are currently, right? So that's going to be the current expectation for the Fed Funds futures, which right now 300 to 325 basis points means that we're going to see a 75 basis points. And that expectation has moved up from one month ago, which is the lightest and the shortest bar over here. And this right here is for 50 basis points, which you'll notice has gone down, right? So it's actually uh, the expectation for a 50 has gone down versus the expectation for a 75, which has gone up. So market is now, you know, more or less anticipating uh, for the Fed to increase rates by 75 basis points. And despite that, we have seen the markets in a very, very strong footing from a bullish perspective. And we have seen a strong rally over the last six to eight weeks. So that's where we are. We've also got a game going. So we've got the Fed bingo if you want to play. So these are all the words that I just wanted to create uh, very quickly. These are all the words. If, of course, Jerome Powell says, then you just pretty much cross those off. Um, and of course, you know, uh, you can you can get a drink of coffee or whatever. You know, I prefer water, but whatever works for you. Of course, it's Friday. But this right here, every time he says a word, you got to drink. So uh, again, I can share this in our discord if anybody's interested, but I'll keeping I'll be keeping a close eye on this as well. So uh, just a little bit of fun, uh, of course, with everything that's going on with Jackson Hole and everything. So uh, that's where we are. And uh, QQQ is pushing higher. So we're up 42 basis points now. Let's just quickly break down the um, the numbers that came out at 830 a.m. Eastern as well, right? So that's going to be um, Transitory is missing. So M, I took that out uh, because I, I don't think that he's going to go back to that transitory word. Um, but yeah, I, you know, you can add your own words as well. But I just found it a little bit interesting that we can, you know, kind of do that and uh, see what he has to say. So there's some interesting stuff there. By the way, consumer sentiment also comes out at 10 a.m. Eastern. So that also comes out at the same time as when Jerome Powell is talking. So that is going to be very, very important. Um, <laughs> Wow, Caddy, that's some next level nerdy stuff. So yeah, I mean, I took the time to really just, you know, dissect some things and some keywords and what he might talk about. So uh, yes, I'm a nerd in that way. So consumer sentiment again comes out at 10 a.m. Eastern, the expectation here. All right, I don't know why I'm getting that service error here. So let's see if I can open this up again. Uh, again, you know, Jerome Powell over here, 10 a.m. Eastern, that's gonna be very important. Of course, uh, let's take a look at these personal income and retail inventories as well whenever this thing loads. Uh, by the way, retail inventories and wholesale inventories were higher uh, when it comes to inflation numbers. And that might be one of the reasons why the market is pushing higher. This is not loading up right now for me, uh, but I shared this in our Discord and that was that um, inflation numbers came down, right? On a year-over-year -year basis, headline and core, they both came down. 
and uh, John says stuff. Yeah, I want to keep it. I want to keep it uh, friendly over here. I don't want to say that word that Puneet wrote, but um, yeah. So inflation numbers came down on both headline and core basis month over month. Core went up 0.1 percent, and headline came down. 0.1%. So this was much better than what the expectations were. Um, and that's that's really good, right? So we are seeing kind of like that continuation from what we got the CPI and the and the um, uh, and the PPI numbers earlier this month. So you know, this was expected. But one of the things that I do want to point out is that if you come over to our inflation spreadsheet, August is not looking super great. So this is uh, again for the months of June and July. These are all the stuff that I'm actually tracking. Uh, you can access this with our Patreon if you are part of it. You can access all these Google spreadsheets, including the S&P 500's valuation as well. But uh, this is something that I've been tracking based on the grains, which is going to be food prices and all that stuff, metals and materials, and then energy prices. So we did see a nice decline in both the months of June and July, right? So that's been good. That's These are been our leading indicators to really understand what those future inflation prints might look like. In August, though, we are seeing a reversal in grains, right? So food prices are on the move. So they are definitely pushing higher in the month of August. Uh, metals and materials have also, especially copper prices and cotton have been pushing higher. Some of them are still down. And then natural gas is still up over 13% in the month of August. And gasoline is now reversing back higher. So if I go over to crude oil uh, because of how much it's been pushing up recently. So if I go over to the monthly chart, now it is only down 5.4%, right? So it was lower, much lower. It was down over 10%, uh, but right now it is only down 5.4%. So something to keep in mind because, you know, we've still got about a week and a half left until uh, this month closes out. And uh, if oil prices revert back to green, then of course, um, you know, inflation might still be under pressure for next month. That's going to be coming out for the month of August. So just something to keep in mind as well uh, from an inflation standpoint. All right, so let me see. Let me let me take a look at some of the comments here. Um, so, what time is uh, Jerome Powell speaking? He's going to be talking at 10 a.m. Eastern. So, uh, in about 45 minutes or so, we will be listening in live. And uh, yeah, we'll be we'll be listening in. We'll take we'll take a look at the market reaction and see how you know the market responds to it. I did a I did a new type of video um, for for everybody who's interested. Um, this was more on a shorter time frame. So we talked about some of the patterns for SPY and QQQs. So, you know, right now we are kind of gap, expected to gap up higher at 420. So we're definitely pushing higher as there's a lot of volume coming through. And we're getting that breakout past 419 at the moment right now for SPY. So this right, right here would be that support level uh, to really pay attention to on the day. If we do end up opening above 419.51, which it does seem like we will, uh, that right there would be that support. And of course, we're kind of looking to fill this gap in all the way up to as much as 421, 422 would be some levels to pay attention to on the SPY. And this right here would be QQQs. Uh, we're now getting up to a resistance uh, as much as 322. So that right there is going to be that level to watch. And now we're starting to fill in this gap as well. So this entire gap will probably be filled today, this right here. And this is a gap that we left back here. This was the entire gap that QQQs left. Uh, this is back on August 9th and August 10th. So we immediately kind of gapped up. Uh, over here and then we just you know went straight up uh, so now we're just coming back down and we you, you know this right here was kind of interesting because you've got this big gap which just didn't fill get filled on the way up and on the way down right it's pretty crazy so now we're actually seeing some trading activity take place inside this gap which like i said was left on the way up and on the way down so 322 is going to be that level to watch uh, as a resistance um on the day at least so uh, that's where we are. Volatility is uh, selling off a little bit, only down 18 basis points, not by a whole lot. Uh, now trading at under 22. Um, and then uh, this right here, we got up to as much as 24, 25 levels. And then, of course, starting to sell off from those levels. And oil prices, we already talked about, getting a little bit of validation at 90 bucks, 90 to 91 dollars around those levels. And then Ethereum uh, is just consolidating sideways at 16, 1700 dollars. And then Bitcoin also just consolidating sideways uh, at the moment at 21, 22,000. Um, so Frankie, what do I think about Zoom? I've actually done a video on Zoom uh, several times. Um, you can watch that on the channel. Um, we'll definitely take a look, uh, you know, when the market opens, if you have time, we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at that as well. But I have done several videos on Zoom as well, recently even going over their earnings uh, as well. 
Uh, I think Powell will break this Jackson Hole speeches streak when nothing bad happened to the markets afterwards. Today we will hear some strong statements and we'll see hawkish Powell. Uh, it's possible. I, I wouldn't be surprised if he is hawkish, uh, you know, just to make sure that, um, you know, he kind of reaffirms his stance on restoring price stability and doesn't want to get complacent, right? Uh, because I think he doesn't understand that on the transitory front, he did get complacent with inflation. He just doesn't want to make that mistake on another time on the way down, right? So he just wants to make sure that, okay, uh, I, want to, I want to come off as somebody who really wants inflation back down, wants to restore price stability. And he's already mentioned, um, you know, they're not going to hesitate. They're going to do whatever it takes. They're going to use all of their tools. And this is something that we also talked about in our previous live stream, right? I asked you guys um, if there was an option, right? If, if there was, um, if, if the Fed were to pick one goal, would it be restoring price stability or foregoing uh, a very, very brutal recession, right? Most people said that, okay, they will be picking restoring price stability. They will be picking inflation, right? The more important goal for them is not to support the economy at this moment. It is to bring down inflation. Um, and, you know, when I asked everybody in our previous live stream, most people also, you know, mentioned that, okay, bringing out inflation is their biggest priority right now. That's their big objective uh, because Jerome Powell's also mentioned time and time again that nothing really works. Nothing works long term unless inflation is back down. So that I think is going to be very, very important. And uh, inflation tracker is going to be important. Oil prices, food prices, all of those are going to be leading indicators to really understand um, what inflation prints are going to look like in the future months. So let's see here. Affirm crazy guidance and ridiculous market cost, marketing costs, such a disappointment. Let's take a look at uh, Affirm. How is it doing? I think last time I checked it was down. So, okay, 10% down right now. Uh, we can take a look at a few stocks that reported earnings uh, before the market opens and we'll kind of switch over to the indices. Uh, but Affirm looks like they missed on EPS, a little bit of beat on revenue. Let's see what they actually uh, reported here. So fiscal fourth quarter loss widens as revenue rises, issues first quarter fiscal year 2023 20, guidance here. Um, so EPS was a loss of 65 cents per share down from 46 cents per share. So a little bit of a wider loss and coming in worse than expectations. Revenue came in at 364, up from 261. And that was also uh, exceeding expectations at 355. For the full fiscal year 23, the company said it expects revenue between 1.63 and 1.73 billion. The analysts were expecting 1.9 billion. So came in shy of expectations. If you go with 1.7 billion in uh, revenue, right now trading at nine times, well, $9 billion, 1.7, about 5.2 times sales. So five and a half, close to 5.2 times sales is gonna be that number for a firm. Of course, we don't have an, have an earnings multiple, we don't have a free cash flow multiple or an EBITDA multiple because well, a firm's not profitable in that regard yet. So, so Ken says, so no more rate hikes in QT. Well, no, they are going to do that. They are going to raise rates and do QT. QT is gonna start in September, by the way, the real one. In other words, that they're really gonna start um, doing that more aggressively. Um, so yeah, September 1st, they're gonna start shrinking their balance sheet on a much bigger scale. Um, so that's gonna be very important for the markets. It's gonna be equivalent to about 0.75 percentage rate hike uh, from an interest rate standpoint as well. So, all right, let's see here. So, Caddy, we don't know if inflation has peaked. All we know is that inflation is everywhere and there are sectors where it is sticky uh, and hard to beat. Fed needs to make people poor. Um, well, so yeah, I mean, you're right. I think the, the inflation story is more broad-based. Um, of course, most of that drive, initial drive, was because of energy and, and food, and it's still kind of there. Uh, but now we're starting to see core also push higher, right? So I think last report, we actually saw month over month CPI not unchanged, 0.0%, .0 and core actually went up. And same thing happened today, right, on the PCE number, where headline was down 0.1%, right? So it was actually down on a month over month basis, and core went up. 0.1%. So we are seeing a little bit of other sectors um, kind of catch up to, to overall inflation. And those sectors are also seeing some price increases, but they're not at the same scale as what energy and food has done, right? They have gone up, say, 70 to 80% energy has, and food might have gone up like 20, 30%. Um, whereas other, other parts of the economy might be up like 
eight to ten percent over the last one year, right? I mean, shelter is only a five percent, six percent over the last one year uh, when it comes to um, that price uh, in in the, in the context of overall CPI numbers. So. So are they switching to active QT by selling their balance sheet? Uh, M&A, no. So they're still going to be doing passive QT as far as I know, as far as I'm aware. So uh, we might get some uh, new updates today, but right now, as it stands, they're still expected to just simply roll off uh, their balance sheet by maturing securities and not really reinvesting them back into buying new bonds. So whatever they receive back in uh, principle, they're just going to uh, retire those bonds and not really go out and start buying them anymore. Um, so that is, uh, again, just going to be a passive way for them to uh, um, tighten the economy. So no, I'm not buying a firm at the moment, uh, Monique. So that's not a stock that uh, is on my watch list right now. Um, market always dives in September, whatever happens today. Yes, yeah, September seasonality wise has not been super great. Uh, we actually have a chart for that. Let me see if I can bring that up uh, over here. This is the chart. So this right here, September, the least wonderful time of the year for stocks. Uh, and this is going back as far as 1928. So you can see how on a monthly seasonality basis, uh, September is the brutalist. I don't even know if that's a word. It's the worst uh, month for uh, the stock market um, in the entire year, right? So S&P 500 average monthly return is over 1%. And this is the average, right? Some might be higher, some might be lower, some Septembers might even be green. But on average, this is the biggest monthly drop uh, that we see uh, for the S&P 500. Of course, Q4 has always been the strongest. Uh, this is uh, the three month rally that you know everyone seems to expect or kind of like that Christmas rally or winter rally or whatever. Um, those three months, you know, October, November, December, this is the holiday season. Lots of people spending lots of money. Advertising spending is going higher. Businesses are doing a lot of revenue and, and customers and all that stuff. So Q4 is usually one of the best times in the market, but September, yeah, it's uh, pretty brutal. Um, <laughs> uh, going back as far as 1928, so we're almost going back 100 years uh, to look at that data. Um, so yeah, that, that is uh, true. On a seasonality basis, September is not super great. Um, all right, let's see. If you have any questions, let me know. The market opens in about eight minutes. Let's see where we are on the polls. We haven't checked the polls yet. So, all right, we got 58% expecting the markets to be green. So more than half of people joining in expect the markets to be higher today uh, and 35% expecting the markets to be red and about 7% flat. So I think that was a good poll. Um, I think that, that we can end it there. And then another poll that I wanna do, uh, Powell today will be hawkish, dovish. I think those are the two only ones we can do. Um, hawkish or dovish, right? Meaning that is he gonna be aggressive in his stance? Uh, is he going to really uh, portray himself that he wants a resource price stability? He's gonna do whatever it takes, take interest rates higher and higher. Um, and then of course, dovish is gonna be, uh, or kangaroo. <laughs> so we're just gonna put those two for now uh, and see where we are because that's a much easier poll uh, for us to kind of look at. So, so yeah, make sure that you do vote. Vokerish, I like that, that would be like, even 10, 10 grade above hawkish, right? That would be like next level hawkish. Um, and Powell will be Powell, yes. Uh, I think he does a really good job in kind of dodging a lot of the questions. So that I think is gonna be very exciting as well. Uh, of course, there's not gonna be any questions anyway, but um, hawkish, very hawkish, extremely hawkish. Yeah, we can put that too as well, but you know, pretty much covers all of that in just one vote here, so. Yeah, let us know what everybody thinks. Uh, talking a little bit about the yields. So 10-year yields are coming down um, a little bit. So we are down to uh, just over 3%. So this, you know, 10-year yields have pushed up to over 3.1, 3.15%. So we were much higher a few days ago. I did a video on this as well uh, because I think this is a very, very notable move in the 10-year yields, you know, pushing up um, about 25% uh, in the last, um, what, few weeks and that's a 50 basis point move for the 10 year yields the spreads are still negative so we got the 10 versus the two still down to negative 38 basis points uh, we got the 10 versus six months down about 20 basis points and uh, 10 versus five still negative uh, 12 basis points right now so all spreads 
have been negative, they are still negative. Yield curves are still inverted, which do represent a pretty significant signal for a recession in the US. Um, I also tweeted about an earnings recession. I did a video on this as well, uh, kind of distinguishing um, the the what, what a difference is between earnings recession and an economic recession. Uh, earnings recession pretty much follows an economic recession, and that is when two consecutive quarters of earnings in the S&P 500 decline, or corporate profits, if you want to call it, decline uh, on a year-over-year -year basis. And in the second quarter, 2022, we're going to do a pop quiz, and this is going to be a little bit of a difficult one. So earnings for the S&P 500, I got I to gotta see if I, even I remember this number. Uh, let me see. So earnings uh, were, okay. Yeah, so earnings in the S&P 500 um, for the second quarter were overall on a blended basis were up 6.7%. Uh, what was the sector that was the biggest contributor to the earnings growth? And second part to that question is going to be, which, if you were to take that sector out, uh, what was the actual earnings change? What was the actual earnings change if you take that sector out? <laughs> no cheating. So, okay, I think the first one, everybody's got it right. Um, so Oscar says oil. That man walking says energy, energy. Oleg says tech. Interesting. Um, energy. So yes, the correct answer is energy. Energy had the biggest contribution to the overall gain in the earnings for the S&P 500 in the second quarter. So you guys are all right. If you take energy out though, what was the actual change in the S&P 500 earnings? That's gonna be a tougher question. I gotta, I gotta remember myself. I gotta remember too. I can't even remember what that number was, but I'm pretty sure I know it. But um, yeah, what was that change if you exclude for energy? So let me know in the live chat if, if anybody remembers. I, uh, again, did a video on this. Very, very important because it really goes to show. So Fernand says minus 2.4%, minus 1.5%, uh, 0%, 0%. Usher Deep says negative. So yes, I do think it's negative. I, I do think it's negative 3.6%, I think is the correct answer. We can take a look before the market opens because, again, that is really, really important as well. Um, and the reason why that's so important is because it really gives us a good sense of if energy prices, how much contribution they're actually making, overall energy prices are making on the overall earnings of the S&P 500. And if you were to exclude, what is the strength of the uh, energy sector? Okay, so excluding. So yeah, I was right, 3.6, 3.7%. So this right here is the chart, right? So you can take a look at this chart and you can see if you were to take a look at S&P 500, 6.7% was that blended growth rate for the second quarter. And if you take that sector out, excluding energy, it was a negative 3.7%, right? It just goes to show how strong other sectors were in the second quarter. And the answer is not that strong. It was, you know, we actually saw a decline in overall earnings, 3.7%. Uh, for the entire fiscal year or calendar year 22, 8.9% uh, is the estimate, right? That's what we have over here. So if you come over here, you can see 8.9%, almost 10% almost is what I have, $230 is the EPS for 2022. Um, and uh, and uh, if you take energy out, the growth rate is only 2.4%. So energy definitely has a pretty big outsized move um, in the overall S&P 500. And um, if, if we do see consecutive quarters of, you know, this weakness kind of prolonging, then there's going to be some debate on whether we have an earnings recession or not. Because, again, energy is kind of having those outsized um, contributions. All right, so... All right, so market's gonna open in about a minute here. I've actually done a video on public storage as well, Pratesh, so you can check that out if you haven't already. I do like the company. I haven't updated my analysis on them in a long time, so I'll definitely do an, an updated analysis on them very soon here. Uh, but let's take a look at where we are with the poll uh, for that hawkish. Okay, so 70% expecting Fed, Powell, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell to be hawkish today and only 30% expecting for him to be dovish uh, and show some generosity towards the market. So we'll see, obviously, how the markets react um, to to his hawkish tone um, or whatever he says. Um, but I'm going to end the poll there. Make sure that you also drop a like. Uh, let's see if we can at least get up to over 300 likes, half 
of what we have in terms of viewers. So I would really appreciate that very much. Um, and we are ready to go. I'm gonna open up the NASDAQ here, S&P, and in about 30 minutes, we've got the uh, Jerome Powell speech. So it's gonna be very, very interesting. And yes, Alibaba's pushing higher. Let's, we'll take a look at that as well. Uh, that's obviously after the fact that, you know, there's a lot of, uh, well, not a lot of, but some resolution to the uh, auditing issues and a lot of Chinese companies that were dealing with that are starting to get um, some resolution for that as U.S. regulators will fly out to Hong Kong and will try to um, audit their books. And NEO is also up over 3.4%. I did a video on them yesterday. I did a bit of video on both NEO and Alibaba, so you can check that out. Uh, but Alibaba here up almost 5%. Very, very nice move. And NEO is also pushing up uh, over 3.5%, getting back over $20 right now so um there we go index opening nasdaq pretty much opening flat um so we were higher but we were just opening flat here uh s p 500 also flat and we got the dow jones also just more or less uh flat open here on the day so far let's take a look at some individual stocks because we haven't talked about uh, apple and nvidia and all those companies so uh, apple here up 16 basis points just trading over 170 nvidia is just under 180 dollars nvidia had an insane rally yesterday it pretty much got bought up very very quickly it was up four percent yesterday uh, but right now just more or less flat here and tesla 298 is where we are uh, for tesla right now so up over 63 basis points now for tesla i think a 300 dollar retest is a possibility uh, on the day, we'll see if it actually breaks out above that level. But, you know, again, going over to some of the charts I shared in our uh, earlier video, this is the entire pattern on a more 15 minute time frame for, for Tesla, right? So if you kind of come back a little bit and, and you look at how we've been trading, uh, it's been mostly consolidating in somewhat of this symmetrical triangle, right? So we've got lower highs over here uh, and we've got some higher lows over here for Tesla. Um, so $300 is a possibility where we get up to uh, right here. So that's going to be that lower high uh, for Tesla. And of course, support level is going to stay put down to 290 down to 285, where, you know, we have validated very, very nicely a couple of times over here. So nice validation, nice validation, of course, nice validation over here. So uh, those right there are going to be some levels to watch uh, for Tesla here intraday. So uh, that's where we are. And uh, again, it's going to be interesting uh, to see how the markets react to it. AMD here is selling off over 1% at the moment. And we've got, um, let's see, Amazon on the day also selling off down 14 basis points right now. So we're gonna keep a close eye on these two charts here. Quite interesting, right? So we actually didn't open uh, as much as 320. We were much higher pre-market, but then immediately we sold off and gapped lower uh, to just open right where we were yesterday. So we're pretty much in the shadow of yesterday's candle right now. And uh, this is gonna be SPY. Uh, we're seeing 419.51 play out as a resistance right now. Uh, this is something, again, we talked about in our previous videos and I shared this chart in our Discord as well. So uh, very, very important resistance for SPY is gonna be $419.51. So 419.51 is gonna be that resistance. We pretty much you know, got rejected at 419.59. So if you kind of come back on the chart, You'll notice a previous nice validation and support um, for um, the SPY there. So we'll see if we actually do break out uh, on any volume. And of course, we got an unfilled gap all the way over here, sitting up to as much as 420s and 421. Uh, so Dow, hi, Ren, that's a great question. So Dow, I think I've did analysis as well. Uh, let me see if it's on this one or might be on a different chart here. So let me see if it's on this one. Uh, there we go. So this right here is the Dow um, stock, uh, Dow Dow Jones, right? So pretty much what we had over here for the Dow Jones was um, a very, very large gap that it left after the big gap up over here. So this was the big gap up. Uh, then we got rejected over here. We kind of sold off then big breakout all the way up. So right now what we're dealing with is we pretty much kind of filled this gap in. And right now we're possibly kind of working our way through over here. This is going to be the next area. 336 is what I would be paying attention to for the Dow Jones to see if it actually gets up there. Um, and right now it looks like it is starting to uh, fill in more of that gap that it left uh, before we saw that gap down. So that would be the level to watch. And of course, we've also got a few more areas to watch all the way up here. Um, there's going to be some gaps all the way up here as well for 
the Dow Jones, which are still unfilled at the moment. Um, so Chinese stocks are doing really well today because, again, there was some big catalyst on the uh, on on that U.S. regulatory front, where you know there was mentioned that U.S. regulators are going to fly out to audit some of these Chinese companies. So that is one of the big catalysts there for uh, a lot of Chinese stocks to be doing really well. I did a video on Neo and Alibaba yesterday. So right now they're both pushing up three to four percent right now. So very very uh, strong gains. So let's take a look at Google as well. Google, how are they doing? Uh, right now, so Google is down about one and a half percent right now, uh, at the moment. So, um, so Oleg says betting record green for Nasdaq, four to five percent when the best Jay Powell speaks. So yeah, record four to five percent would be pretty significant, right? That would be a very, very strong uh, move in the NASDAQ. I mean, you on a 5% NASDAQ day, you'd expect individual stocks such as Tesla, Apple, Amazon, Google, Meta, some of those companies to be up like over eight to as much as 10%. And that would be just an insane uh, green day for the market. So uh, yes, I, I, like the, I like the prediction. I like the optimism and the enthusiasm, but we also got to keep things, you know, a little bit realistic um, because NASDAQ 5% is just insane. Um, you know, from, from that scale. I mean, we're, we're making progress for 5%. We're going up uh, all the way up to 13,250, right? That's like over uh, seven, 650, almost 700 point move in one day. It's, po- it's possible, but it's just, you know, it's going to take a lot of volume for us to drive us there. Um, Chenta says, yeah, I mean... In- in, I mean, like in general, right? A lot of stocks need to push up quite a bit because it happens both on the upside and the downside. Uh, when, when Obviously, when the NASDAQ is down 2%, you won't find individual stocks down 2%. You'll find them down 3 4 5 6% because, you know, that's how volatility and, and just beta works. And that obviously happens on the upside as well. So, yeah, but, you know, collectively, I think a lot of people are expecting Powell to be hawkish. Um, and I think only 30% expecting Powell to be dovish right now in the markets uh, when he speaks in about 20 minutes or so. Um, But the Dow making some moves up 13 basis points. We've got the NASDAQ here more or less flat. And again, just anticipating what what will um, Jay Powell talk about. And the S&P 500 also just flat, not really moving at all. NVIDIA is a one that is starting to pull back a little bit, 1.2%. And then Google is down 1.6. AMD is down over 1%. And Apple pretty much flat right now. So among our Fang Mint stocks here, Google surprisingly down 1.6%. NVIDIA is also down, AMD, Amazon, and then uh, Meta is up over half a percent right now. So, <laughs> so Kevin says, Jay Powell is not going to say anything new except for maybe some things about debt relief. Um, yeah, I mean, that's also a possibility, but you know, I was looking at historical um, Jackson Hole meetings. So let me see if I can... Uh, bring that up let me because i was able to find the let's see um yeah because i did look at the last year's release um for jackson Hole symposium for 2021 right so this is going to be past symposiums so 2021 macroeconomic policy in an uneven economy so you come down here you look at you know jerome h pell over here and you look at these remarks these are pretty detailed Right. So we might get a lot of stuff like opening remarks, monetary policy in the time of COVID, uh, Jerome Powell. And this is like a really, really long page document. Right. You can look at, you know, spending on durable goods has surged. Uh, You can talk about labor market recovering. So unemployment rate. Uh, This is a pretty detailed report that he pretty much shared. So if you get something very similar, I mean, the market's going to be digesting this, uh, you know, and that's a lot of uh, remarks. And it's a lot of data. That's a lot of report straight from Jerome Powell. So, you know, that's going to be. Uh, 14 pages. So we'll see, you know, if something, if he gets something very similar uh, this year, which, you know, again, it should come up here, uh, his remarks as soon as this thing loads. So I'm going to continue to kind of reload this uh, and see if anything comes up as a PDF document that we can kind of download and see what his remarks are going to be like. Uh, but this, like I said, was a pretty interesting document last year that he released um, during the same Jackson Hole Symposium. So something to keep in mind, obviously. Yeah, Oscar says, you mean the event when he said inflation was transitory? Yes. Well, the market did move, right? Market moved on that day, on that event. So 
uh, that's that's really all that matters to the market here. Um, all right, so let's see here. So yeah, also looking at the last 10 years. So, you know, when we did, I did my personal analysis, well, 73% of the times the markets were higher on the day of Jerome Powell's speech. Well, not just Jerome Powell, but any Fed chair. Uh, of course, we had Janet Yellen before Jerome Powell. Um, so on the day of Jackson Hole's economic symposium, we've had the markets push up 73% of the times. Uh, and the average gain has been about half a percent. So there is some bullishness and optimism going into this, this uh, conference. Uh, but, you know, times have really been different. I mean, we haven't really seen a 40-year high inflation uh, up until now. So this, these are very uh, different times than, you know, what the analysis might have been for, let's say, the last 10 years or so. So, so robots will digest this in a minute. Yes, uh, I, yes, algorithms and everybody who is kind of using one of those, they will pretty much look for keywords, right? So they will, they will kind of scan through all the keywords and they'll obviously make those decisions within seconds whether they want to buy or sell. So I think they do that with earnings calls, transcripts. They do that with any economic release. Um, uh, a lot of these algorithms pretty much just, you know, look at these reports uh, very, very quickly and then just like make their decisions off of it. Uh, and yes, Oscar brings up a great point. Doesn't mean that it, they will get it right because most of the time that will usually lead to like a lot of overreaction and then kind of market stabilizing a little bit. Yeah. So. <laughs> uh, Caddy, be honest with us. You made bingo table to feed the poll results to your algo. <laughs> I'm not that complicated, man. I'm not that techie. I'm not that nerdy. So I'm obviously not. But this is interesting, right? It really should be fun. Um, how many of you actually believe that some of these? So, all right, we've got data dependent. We've got soft landing. We've got China. We've got rate cuts, central bank rate hikes. We got balance sheet, jobless claims economic downturn, we got COVID-19, supply chain, labor market, core inflation, price stability, American people, food prices, basis points, oil, Russia, monetary policy, unemployment, manufacturing, consumer sentiment, recession, recovery. So I think I'm pretty much spot on. I think almost all of them will get hit. We've got 25 words here. So I don't know, should be interesting. <laughs> so it should be, should be fun. Uh, and again, we'll just listen in what he has to say. And then of course, uh, keep a close track of some of these words. <laughs> uh, I think you should use this bingo table for your next quiz. Yes, we're probably going to do that for a pop quiz. Which word was the most used by Jerome Powell in the most recent Jackson Hole Economics Symposium? <laughs> so, all right, going back to these charts here. So you can pretty much see this is the 15 minute time frame, right? Spy getting a big rejection still at 419.51. 4 so we're definitely, you know, getting a lot of resistance there. Uh, right now, support level is going to stay put at 417.62. So this is a level that we got rejected at yesterday. Uh, you kind of pull back on the chart a little bit. And we have found some resistance here in the past as well. Eventually finally breaking out. And then, uh, of course, just consolidating sideways here in validation for SPY. So, yeah, that, that should be interesting as to where we end up on the day. And QQQ is also more or less consolidating. You're not seeing a lot of price action, um, you know, of course, ahead of the speech. Uh, we are seeing a little bit of selling pressure, but I think the real judgment, real directional move is gonna come after, uh, you know, the speech is done, so. So, uh, take two interactive, let's just quickly run through our watch list here. Um, We'll start with ARC, and ARC is down anywhere between uh, 20 basis points to as much as 1.5%, so ARKG is down a lot more, 1.5% right now, so selling off. And then we got banks here. Uh, they are green, so they are pushing higher. Uh, you know, as, as interest rate expectations have kind of moved away a little bit, so you know, if you come over to our other, this one. So as interest rate expectations have really um, you know, moved back up to 75 basis points, uh, we are seeing uh, banks kind of push higher. They have been doing a lot better um, recently, along with energy sectors. Um, then we got crypto. We've already gone over Chinese stocks. We've already talked about those as well. Uh, lots of momentum coming in for Alibaba, Neo, JD.com, some of those companies. Um, and then cybersecurity here. We are seeing crowd slightly down. 
Uh, again, just more or less flat here, not really moving all that much, uh, only down about 40, 50, 60 basis points right now. And then energy sector is also just flat. Uh, we got crude oil slightly down 1%, uh, coming down to $92, $93 a barrel. Um, and then Occidental is up to $74, $75. Devon and Shell also just slightly up over 90 basis points. Fintech, um, we got a firm on earnings down. We broke down, we broke down a firm's earnings earlier, uh, down over 12%. And then PayPal, Visa, MasterCard, Ally, SoFi, Upstart, they're all just you know pretty much flat or slightly down about 1% to 2%. Um, retailers on the day, uh, Dollar General, I think reported earnings yesterday. So uh, yeah, they reported earnings yesterday. They actually beat on both revenue and EPS. Uh, so they are down today, but they were, well, they were down yesterday as well, but they got bought up yesterday intraday. Uh, but overall, we're seeing kind of like a mixed move in retailers and staple stocks right now. Uh, so Amazon, yeah, Amazon potentially buying EA. So I read about that as well. Um, let's see if there's any update or catalyst on that. Amazon's pretty much flat here on the day right now. Um, so Amazon is not expected to bid for electronic arts, CNBC said, citing sources, uh, quashing an earlier report that an online giant would make an offer today for the video game publishers. So yeah, they're not uh, buying EA. Um, so they're not, they're not going to be bidding on that company. Um, Amazon buying everything. Uh, they're also closing stuff too. I mean, I think they, they closed out their Amazon healthcare business. Um, just, I think I read that report a couple of days ago where Amazon is shutting down their healthcare. I think that, that was one of the reasons why Teladoc was pushing higher, right? So over here, Thursday following reports that Amazon is shutting down its Amazon Care telehealth unit because it couldn't provide a complete enough offering for the large enterprise customers. It was targeting, um, and then of course, Teladoc and some of the other companies kind of rallied on that news uh, quite a bit. So about 13 minutes uh, left until we get that speech going. I'm just gonna keep a check on that as well. Just wanna make sure. All right, so we'll just we'll just uh, you know keep this stream on, and uh, we'll continue to monitor this as soon as this opens up. Uh, I'm gonna do like an audio check with this as well, so make sure that you just you know let me know if the audio is working well, and I just don't want it to like be too loud or too uh, to the volume to be just appropriate um, when when he goes live. So I was talking a little bit about the dollar too. Um, so US dollar here, uh, just taking a look at some currencies. So we're just at one uh, right now. We're just literally at parity uh, once again. Uh, obviously this has been quite a brutal time for the Euro because the dollar has just been getting stronger and stronger. DXY um, you know, was up to as much as 109 again. So it seems like it is finding some resistance area over here at this level, like close to 109.258. So you know, we've seen a very, very strong move in the dollar um, ever since the year started. So uh, very consistent validation from that 50 EMA. I mean, it's not just once, but several times. I mean, it's been perfectly validated here, uh, validated over here. Of course, it's been bouncing off of these levels. So 106, 105 is gonna be that next level to really watch if the dollar continues to sink here. Um, and dollar going down is actually good for uh, U.S. corporations as ju that just do business globally, um, you know, for the likes of FANG stocks and any other global global stocks that have a much bigger influence on the markets overall, uh, they benefit when the dollar goes down. So, um, <laughs> so Powell says he's not going to identify himself as a money printer. <laughs> um, John says EA is the worst company in America. Uh, I do like some of their games. I mean, I, I do like FIFA. I mean, that's one game that I play pretty much all the time. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's that's one game that I do think they've done a pretty good job in kind of building. So, 
All right, talking a little bit about um, some of the technicality uh, in terms of percentage of stocks that are trading above or lower uh, their certain moving averages. So this is gonna be S&P 500 stocks now trading above their 20-day moving average. Uh, so right now, uh, it's back over 55%, all right? So we've got more than half stocks in the S&P 500 now trading back above its 200 simple moving average. Uh, this right here was the two-day decline Friday on Monday, where we saw you know lots of stocks sell off and right now we're getting a little bit of a bounce back higher in this index now if you take a look at where we were before this two-day sell-off of friday and monday uh, we were pretty much at this resistance right so if you take a look at the very top at 86 percent 93 percent you've got almost all stocks trading above their 20-day moving average so short-term momentum was very strong so it was not a surprise why we saw a little bit of a pullback here the way we did because every time we get up to those levels well look what happens sell off sell off sell off pull back, you know, pull back, pull back, pull back, pull back, pull back. So it's not a surprise when we get a little bit of a retracement once we get up to those levels uh, for, for this particular indicator. Then, of course, we got other ones to watch out for as well. These are going to be S&P 500 stocks that are trading above their 200 simple moving average. So right now, we're nowhere near close to where we were uh, back in April of 21 when this sell-off really started to, started to begin, like, happen. Uh, July, June, July, 2021, there's obviously a lot of stocks. And then the S&P 500 really started falling off back in November and December when this index was still at 76, 77%. Uh, we're coming off of really low percentages, 11%. Uh, you know, this was back in June, uh, June 17, 16, when the markets kind of literally uh, marked that low for the year so far. We're back over 41, 42%. So uh, this is also something to keep in mind for S&P 500 stocks. And uh, right now we're kind of like in that neutral range, right in the middle, not really moving all that much. So uh, we got the NASDAQ now down about half a percent um, uh, at the moment. And we got the S&P 500 down 27 basis points and the Dow Jones also more or less flat here. Let's see what's actually driving this move lower. Nvidia is down 2%. So selling off a little bit, giving up on some of the gains from yesterday. Um, and then we've got uh, mostly all FANG stocks now. FANG men stocks are all red. So NVIDIA down 2%, Google is down 1.75, AMD is down 1%, Amazon Meta also down about a third of a percent, Netflix, Microsoft, Apple, and Tesla is kind of holding up. 296, 297, barely green, um, just, uh, just trading at about roughly under $300 at the moment. So, so big lots, uh, solid dividend stock. You're welcome. Let's take a look. I have uh, looked into big lots before, I think once. Um, ticker symbols BIG. Got a 5.25% yield. Uh, good, decent revenue here. Earnings um, just about 2%, 3% margin. Valuation should be really low, I'm assuming. 10 times earnings, less than one time sales, 16 times cash flow, and five times enterprise value EBITDA. Uh, so what, what, what does Big Lots really do? I know it's like a really big retail discount store, but is it like similar to like Costco or something? What do they sell? Um, engaged in the operation of retail stores, operates through discount retailing segment. Is it like mostly clothes and stuff? clothes and toys and stuff. Uh, furniture, seasonal, soft home, food, consumables. Okay. Electronics, toys, based out of Columbus, Ohio. Um, yeah, so mostly been um, Kmart. Okay. Kmart would be a better comparison for big lots. Um, so from its peak from June 21, uh, it is down a little bit over 67%. So definitely been selling off uh, quite a bit. I'm definitely going to be paying attention to this support here at $16. $16, $17 is going to be, Joe says, <laughs> random junk. Uh, $16, $17 is going to be that support level uh, to watch for big lots. They do have a pretty good yield, and that yield obviously has gone up because the price has come down so much. 60 70% drop is helping the yield push higher. So let's take a look at ZIM. So Zim today, ZIM, wow, down 11%. So if you guys remember yesterday, I mentioned specifically, be careful with this stock, especially after today, uh, we, because we do have the X dividend date, right? So it's not a surprise. We're seeing a little bit of a downtrend here uh, because of that dividend capture strategy. So, you know, lots of people that kind of own this stock only because of the dividend. 
uh, may not want to hold this after the dividend ex dividend date uh, because they only need to be on the record to receive the dividend. Once they are on the record, they can pretty much sell this stock and move on. Um, and this stock usually does compensate for uh, that change. And I wouldn't be surprised if it does sell off even more um, to compensate for that. But you know, the dividend I think was four dollars and seventy five cents. So four dollars and seventy five cents based on a forty three dollar price was about ten to eleven percent. So I think it's appropriately priced right now being down 10 and a half percent so so don't brokerage charges make hopping in and out of stock expensive yeah it really depends on where you're located especially in the u.s i mean it's pretty much commission free trading right so it's like no commission zero dollars so you can pretty much you know get in and out of trades uh but of course it really depends on where you're trading from i know that some places they're still charging commission fees like three dollars five dollars eight dollars which is you know ridiculous in 2022 uh but you know that's uh, obviously a big consideration if you are looking to day trade or swing trade or if you're looking to invest long term because those costs obviously does add up um so all right so we got about five minutes left uh again we're going to keep a close eye on the fed bingo as well if you want to play along um let me know in the discord i'll, I'll share this uh, with everybody there uh but again we're going to be starting up soon here in about five minutes, I'll do like an audio check um, and then we should be all set with the market's reaction to it. We're gonna put the uh, QQQs over here, the NASDAQ. Uh, we're gonna put the SPY down below because part of the screen will be covered with Jay Powell. Uh, so we're gonna put SPY down below and QQQs up here. Uh, and then we'll put the uh, Dow Jones over here. And then of course the yields down at the bottom left for the markets. So, all right. We are ready, we are ready almost. Um, so Arnold, uh, where do I see the updated allocations? Did I see that or am I crazy? Yes, yeah, so that's gonna be on Patreon. I post all my private videos on Vimeo and that's then integrated over to Patreon. So you should be able to see that on there. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that should really help um, get a good understanding of what stocks I'm invested in. Of course, percentage wise, what are the big, big positions, how much cash I'm holding on to, stuff like that. That doesn't really include the options portfolio. I'll, I'll pretty much do like an options portfolio update separately, um, but those are just stocks only and just a long-term position. Uh, so are you hedged? Um, so how are you hedged? Uh, mostly by co covered calls. So selling covered calls, it's all, it's a, it's a really good hedge in my opinion. All right, so it's starting, I'm getting some noise here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna turn off my microphone and just let me know if you guys can hear that, right? When, whenever it starts. So just give me a thumbs up if you guys can hear that. I will turn off this microphone and I just wanna make sure the audio is good. So if it's too loud or too, uh, you know, you can't hear it, just let me know and I will fix that accordingly. Yeah, I'm gonna close out of this one. There we go. What time is it for you? You look so awake. Uh, it is uh, currently just over, I think 7.30, yeah, 7.30 p.m. at night, in the evening, pretty much. Um, yeah, so that's where we are. Two minutes uh, till we get started here. Uh, we're gonna switch between different stocks as well. Uh, I'll keep Apple up top and then we'll keep Tesla at the bottom. I think those are two like market leaders, I would say. I would say. They kind of drive overall sentiment and you know, just the market indices in general. Please take your seats. Please take your seats. Let me know if you guys can hear this.
So good morning and welcome everyone to the first session of the 2022 Jackson Hole Economic Symposium. Chair Powell, the floor is yours. Please come to the podium. Thank you, Peter, and good morning, everyone. Uh, Esther, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. At past Jackson Hole conferences, I have discussed broad topics, such as the ever-changing structure of the economy and the challenges of conducting monetary policy under high uncertainty. Today, my remarks will be shorter, my focus narrower, and my message more direct. The Federal Open Market Committee's overarching focus right now is to bring inflation back down to our 2% goal. Price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve and serves as the bedrock of our economy. Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. In particular, without price stability, we will not achieve a sustained period of strong labor market conditions that benefit all. The burdens of high inflation fall heaviest on those who are least able to bear them. Restoring price stability will take some time and requires using our tools forcefully to bring demand and supply into better balance. Reducing inflation is likely to require a sustained period of below trend growth. Moreover, there will very likely be some softening of labor market conditions. While higher interest rates, slower growth, and softer labor market conditions will bring down inflation, they will also bring some pain to households and businesses. These are the unfortunate costs of reducing inflation. But a failure to restore price stability would mean far greater pain. The U.S. economy is clearly slowing from the historically high growth rates of 2021, which reflected the reopening of the economy following the pandemic recession. While the latest economic data have been mixed, in my view, our economy continues to show strong underlying momentum. The labor market is particularly strong, but it is clearly out of balance, with demand for workers substantially exceeding the supply of available workers. Inflation is running well above 2%, and high inflation has continued to spread through the economy. While the lower inflation readings for July are certainly welcome, a single month's improvement falls far short of what the committee will need to see before we are confident that inflation is moving down. So we are moving our policy stance purposefully to a level that will be sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2%. At our most recent meeting in July, the FOMC raised the target range for the federal funds rate to two and a quarter to two and a half percent, which is in the summary of economic projections range of estimates of where the federal funds rate is projected to settle in the longer run. In current circumstances, with inflation running far above 2% and the labor market extremely tight, estimates of longer run neutral are not a place to pause or stop. July's increase in the target range was the second 75 basis point increase in as many meetings, and I said then that another unusually large increase could be appropriate at our next meeting. We are now about halfway through the intermeeting period, our decision at the September meeting will depend on the totality of the incoming data and the evolving outlook. At some point, as the stance of monetary policy tightens further, it likely will become appropriate to slow the pace of increases. Restoring price stability will likely require maintaining a restrictive policy stance for some time. The historical record cautions strongly against prematurely loosening policy. Committee participants' most recent individual projections from the June SEP showed the median federal funds rate running slightly below 4% through the end of 2023. Participants will update their projections at the September meeting. Our monetary policy deliberations and decisions build on what we've learned about inflation dynamics, both from the high and volatile inflation of the 1970s and 1980s, and from the low and stable inflation of the last quarter century. And in particular, we're drawing on three important lessons that I'll highlight. The first lesson is that central banks can and should take responsibility for delivering low and stable inflation. 
It may seem strange now that central bankers and others once needed convincing on these two fronts. But as former chairman Ben Bernanke has shown, both propositions were widely questioned during the great inflation period. Today, we regard these questions as settled. Our responsibility to deliver price stability is unconditional. It is true that the current high inflation is a global phenomenon and that many economies around the world face inflation as high or higher than seen here in the United States. It's also true, in my view, that the current infl high inflation in the United States is the product of strong demand and constrained supply, and that the Fed's tools work principally on aggregate demand. None of this diminishes the Federal Reserve's responsibility to carry out our assigned task of achieving price stability. There is clearly a job to do in moderating demand to better align with supply. We are committed to doing that job. The second lesson is that the public's expectations about future inflation can play an important role in setting the path of inflation over time. Today, by many measures, longer term inflation expectations appear to remain well anchored. That is broadly true of surveys of households, businesses and forecasters, and of market-based measures as well. But that is not grounds for complacency, with inflation having run well above our goal for some time. If the public expects that inflation will remain low and stable over time, then absent major shocks, it likely will. Unfortunately, the same is true of expectations of high and volatile inflation. During the 1970s, as inflation climbed, the anticipation of high inflation became entrenched in the economic decision-making of businesses and households. The more inflation rose, the more people came to expect it to remain high, and they built that belief into wage and price decisions. As former Chairman Paul Volcker put it at the height of the great inflation in 1979, Inflation feeds in part on itself, so part of the job of returning to a more stable and more productive economy must be to break the grip of inflationary expectations. One useful insight into how actual inflation may affect expectations about its future path is based in the concept of rational inattention. When inflation is persistently high, households and businesses must pay close attention and incorporate inflation into their economic decisions. When inflation is low and stable, they are freer to focus their attention elsewhere. Former Chairman Alan Greenspan put it this way, for all practical purposes, price stability means that expected changes in the average price level are small enough and gradual enough that they, they do not materially enter business and household financial decisions. Of course, inflation has just about everyone's attention right now, which highlights a particular risk today. The longer the current bout of high inflation continues, the greater the chance that expectations of higher inflation will become entrenched. And that brings me to the third lesson, which is that we must keep at it until the job is done. History shows that the employment costs of bringing down inflation are likely, likely to increase with delay as high inflation becomes more entrenched in wage and price setting. The successful Volcker disinflation of the early 1980s followed multiple failed attempts to lower inflation over the previous 15 years. A lengthy period of very restrictive monetary policy was ultimately needed to stem high inflation and to start the process of getting inflation down to the low and stable levels that were the norm until the spring of last year. Our aim is to avoid that outcome by acting with resolve now. So these lessons are guiding us as we use our tools to bring inflation down we are taking forceful and rapid steps to moderate demand so that it comes into better alignment with supply and to keep inflation expectations anchored. We will keep at it until we're confident the job is done. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Powell. Our first session of the day is reassessing economic constraints, maximum employment. We will hear first from Nicola Fuchs. Shindu. Yeah, so that was it. That was just an eight minute, 10 minute statement, a kind of reinforcing what the central bank's goal is to maintain their pace of interest rate hikes. And obviously we have seen some improvement in the July's inflation numbers, but very, very hawkish tone. Um, some of you were also saying that the hawkish tone um, wait, hold on.
Should be a lot better now. Uh, should be a lot better now. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Should be a lot better now. So very, very hawkish tone from the Fed. Um, pretty much, you know, just maintaining guidance, uh, saying that, okay, 75 basis points, not really obviously explicitly saying it, but uh, definitely um, saying that there are three lessons that they need to kind of abide by. Central bank can and should maintain uh, its policy guidance for continuing to kind of bring inflation back down or at least try to restore price stability as much as they can. Uh, that is their, their main objective. Markets now have been very, very volatile. Of course, we did kind of sell off right when he was talking. And now we're starting to see a little bit of move back higher. Um, he also talked about there is going to be a slowdown in economic growth and there is going to be a, some softening in the labor market as well. And uh, there is obviously going to be some pain in the households. But one of the things that he mentioned from 1970s from Paul Volcker was that uh, the last thing that the economy wants is a more entrenched inflation because then it becomes part of everyday decisions from the people, right? So expectations uh, because it's a very self-feeding sort of phenomenon, right? If people expect prices to rise in the future, then what they do is they start buying today. They want to buy stuff today because they expect prices will be higher a week from now, a month from now. And as more and more people start doing that, well, guess what? Prices actually start going higher and higher. And it, get, it keeps feeding on uh, in itself. So that's something that the Fed wants to avoid uh, and wants to continue to make sure that you know they bring down inflation while they can and not let it be a much longer term problem. So I'll listen in again. I'll do like a summary video going over everything that was discussed. Uh, but that's it. That was there was no questions, obviously, in this meeting. Uh, but September, uh, we will get the entire summary of economic projections as well. Um, and then, of course, we've got the FOMC meeting. Uh, let's just take a quick look on. Well, by the way, uh, I'm pretty sure he mentioned a lot of things here which I will get to as well. Pretty sure I mentioned COVID-19. Uh, didn't quite mention uh, Russia or oil. Definitely mentioned the labor market basis points. Uh, mentioned the supply chain. Didn't mention the American people. Um, mentioned Didn't mention the recession either. Uh, a little bit of recovery, I think I heard. Um, unemployment, I heard. Uh, so there's a lot of, lot of things that he did talk about. And of course, stuff that he didn't mention. But what I'm interested in is the CME FedWatch tool uh, to see... Uh, where the interest rate expectations are going to be. So we are now a little bit back towards uh, 50 basis points because earlier this was as much as over 60%, right? Probability for us to see a 75 uh, basis point hike um, from the Fed funds futures for the interest rates. This is again back going as far as September. Uh, and right now we're back a little bit towards uh, 50 basis points, pretty much break even right now. So it's uh, very much indecided, undecided right now. So lots of indecision and undecided right now um, for the markets when it comes to interest rates at the moment. Um, let me let me see if they have actually put up their remarks for Jerome Powell. Uh, there we go. So written remarks are going to be over here. Um, so again, this is the entire remarks, this entire speech that I'll share with everybody in our Discord as well. Um, so again, I've discuss broad-based topics such as ever-changing structure of the economy and the challenges of conducting monetary policy. So there we go, monetary policy discussed there. Um, today, my remarks will be shorter. My focus is narrow and my message is more direct. Um, so uh, the overarching focus right now is to bring inflation back down to our 2% goal. Uh, price stability is the responsibility of the Federal Reserve and serves as the bedrock of our economy. Without price stability, the economy does not work for anyone. So again, a lot of things we have already heard. I think Kevin mentioned, he said nothing new. Uh, that is true. I think there's a lot of things that were um, not anything new here, but we are moving to our policy stance purposefully to a level that is sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2%. At our most recent meeting in July, the FOMC raised the target range of federal funds rate to 225 to 2.5%, which is in the SEP uh, range of estimates where the federal funds rate is projected to settle in the longer run. Um, in the current circumstances of inflation running up 2%, the labor market extremely tight. The estimates for longer run neutral are not place to stop or pause. So this right here, again, a little bit of a hawkish stance, again, saying that estimates of longer run neutral are not place to stop or pause. So again, just kind of ruling out that Fed pivot possibility. Um, and then July's increase target range was se second 75 basis points increase in as many as uh, meetings. And I said that the another unusually large increase could be appropriate uh, in our next meeting. So again, kind of increasing that possibility for 75 basis points. But I just feel like the market doesn't believe him. I don't know why, because, you know, we're still kind of pretty much flat. In my opinion, it was pretty hawkish from Jerome Powell. Uh, but we did get a little bit of a spike here right after the speech was done. And we're back to pretty much break even here on the day. So uh, either the market is just not 
taking him on his word or it's seeing something a little bit different than what Jerome Powell was talking about. So, you know, only down 23 basis points. S&P is down only 24 basis points. So we're not really moving all that much here. So very much flat here. Look at the wicks on this chart. So uh, very much still getting rejected here for the SPY at 419, 420 levels. Um, and of course, right now, just still pretty much flat. And then we got Apple. Again, was down to as much as 168, 169, then pushing higher. Um, and then we got Tesla now back over to $301. So very nice move, 1.7% gain. Uh, so pushing higher very much. And then AMD, NVIDIA here, more or less just flat. NVIDIA is only down 1%. Um, yes, yeah, so again, I will do a separate video summarizing. It'll only take me four to five minutes. There's not going to be a lot of details there, uh, but uh, I'll, I'll do that in a separate video because most of us just got done listening to him, uh, listening in on what he had to say. Again, very, very short speech, uh, only 10 minutes, nothing compared to what we see for the FOMC because there's also a Q&A session after, nothing compared to what we see during the Senate meetings. Those are really, really long. I mean, in terms of time, uh, Senate meetings are like an entire day event. FOMC is about an hour long and this Jackson Hole Symposium was only about uh, 10 minutes, right? It was just pretty much done before it even started. So. Uh, that's where we are uh, with the markets. It's more or less flat here. Not a lot of change. We did see some volatility. The VIX here, um, again, unchanged, only up 83 basis points. So uh, just under 22 levels at the moment. And the 10-year yields were also uh, moving a little bit. So only up half a percent, so just over 3.04% uh, at the moment. So so yeah, that, uh, I'll kind of summarize that in a separate video. But, uh, but in my opinion, he was pretty hawkish uh, and it kind of reinstating his stance on monetary policy, being a little bit more uh, aggressive and kind of making sure that he, that he you know, comes across as a person who, is, who wants to restore price stability and nothing works uh, unless, of course, he restores price stability. By the way, I just noticed, I think we might have uh, achieved a record. Most people joined us in this live stream ever. Like we've had over 1,200 people right now watching and only 290 likes. So come on, we can do a lot better, but at one point we had over 1,800 people watching. So thank you so much for joining in. I really, really appreciate that. You know, I really wish Jerome Powell was speaking every day so that we can do these live streams and kind of, um, you know, listen in on and how the markets are reacting, but also make sure that you subscribe, right? So if you are anybody who's not subscribed, make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Um, and of course, join us. We talk a lot about fundamental and technical analysis. So <laughs> but he says it's the bingo. <laughs> Yes, it might be. I'll cross out some of those things and I'll share uh, the things that he talked about. He didn't really mention balance sheet at all. Like I thought he was going to be talking a little bit about uh, the quantitative tightening and, you know, the balance sheet reduction plan and whatnot starting in September. Didn't really talk about all that much. So again, very, very short speech um, um, from, from uh, you know, Jerome Powell's perspective. Uh, Volker should be on the bingo sheet. Yes, I think it should be. It definitely should be. I agree. So again, that's going to be it, everybody. Thank you so much for joining in. I really appreciate it. Make sure that you drop a like and of course, subscribe if you are new to the channel here. We talk a lot about fundamental and technical analysis. And of course, uh, the Discord and the Patreon link is going to be down in the description below if you want to join and of course, be a part of our money investing community. Um, you know, get access to all the trade alerts, finance alerts. The spreadsheets are also available for everybody to view. This is our inflation tracker spreadsheet, our S&P 500 valuation spreadsheet. And of course, on top of that, private videos and tutorials on fundamental and technical analysis. So, uh, well, there's more people joining in. Now we're at almost 1100 again. So might as well just stay, right? And, and talk about the markets if you can, I guess, maybe for a few more minutes um, right now. But I'm going to quickly go over some charts that are important. So SPY getting a little bit of rejection there, 419, 420. Uh, I can stay for a few more minutes here. I'll, you know, might as well just stay. Um, so 419, 420, that is a resistance here. You know, we talked about this in our most recent update, that this right here was a level, right? So right here, we're just kind of trading sideways in that range uh, where we're getting rejected here. And of course, support level on the day is going to stay put at 417, 418 levels. Um, right now. And then when we take a look at QQQs, uh, NASDAQ here, we talked about it on that video as well. A bit, by the way, I'll go over NVIDIA and Tesla here in just a minute, uh, because I think there's some really interesting developments on those charts. But uh, QQQs, again, we're just inside this gap. I would also, you know, call this being filled a little bit because there were some longer wick, uh, wicks. So I'm going to kind of close this gap a little bit more. 
So all the way up to 322 is gonna be that resistance. And look where we got retested again, right? If you kind of look at where we got where we were right when Jerome Powell was talking, we came down to do as low as 317, right? 316.52. So a little bit of an undercut there. Uh, you know, broke down slightly before starting to push right back up. So uh, very, very interesting sort of volatility here. Came down, validated support, pushed right back up. Didn't quite fill that gap entirely, but got up to as much as 320 uh, right now. So I do want to go over NVIDIA and Tesla here as well. This is the overall chart for NVIDIA and Tesla. So on the 50, uh, this is the NVIDIA chart right now. On the 15 minute time frame, uh, this was the breakout that we were we were watching and then right now of course consolidating sideways if you kind of zoom out a little bit you'll notice that we do have for nvidia lots of unfilled gaps both on the downside and on the upside with resistance staying put at 181 so this is going to be a very very important level all the way down to as low as 170s so the risk reward trade-off here in my view is a little bit unfavorable on the long side um, of course if it comes down to 169 170 then there's going to be a better risk reward trade-off there for nvidia but it has been mostly consolidating sideways. Everything you see in yellow are the gaps that have been filled and everything that you see in white are the gaps that are still yet to be filled for Nvidia. So we do have one on the upside, two on the downside, probably even more um, further down for Nvidia, but this is gonna be the chart. And then for Tesla, we do have a very, very strong resistance right now. So this is you know, a very interesting level for Tesla here on the lower highs. Uh, at the moment, we're just getting rejected. So we got up to as much as $302, got a little bit of rejection there. So uh, on the 15-minute 15, 15 time frame, that is a very, very important level of resistance to pay attention to. Uh, right now, just trading inside this really, really long symmetrical triangle where if it does come down now, uh, 290s down to 285 are going to be a couple levels to watch, all the way up to 313 and a support at 285. So I covered all of that in my other video that I posted earlier today. So yes, need, NVIDIA needs to cover upside gap. Yeah, I think that's going to be very important as well uh, for for Nvidia, but then Tesla, most of the gaps have been filled. This one, which was left, filled, got filled here. This one over here, this one over here. So we don't have a lot of gaps to fill on either direction. We just have a really, really interesting symmetrical triangle forming for Tesla at the moment. So uh, that's where we are. Once again, thank you so much for joining everybody. We did see the markets be really volatile, but right now we're starting to see a little bit of a selling pressure. Once again, this kind of, I can chalk that up to a little bit of algorithmic trading. No kidding. I mean, this type of volatility on the five minute, you can pretty much chalk that up to uh, just algorithms trading and just quickly selling and then buying right back in. Um, and now the type of selling we're seeing is probably some real volume trying to come in and really understand what Fed Jerome Powell really talked about and once people start to kind of realize that, okay, he was a little bit more hawkish uh, than what markets were anticipating, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, today we kind of roll over a little bit more um, and, and, you know, start to sell off. So thank you so much for joining in. I really appreciate it. Make sure that you drop a like, of course, subscribe, and all the links are going to be down in the description for our Discord if you want to join. And uh, as always, hope you all have a great day. If you have any questions, message me on Discord. I'll jump over uh, there now. And uh, as always, happy investing, and I'll see you guys in